there's one type of an attack that's so brutally effective that it's resulted in the loss of hundreds of millions of dollars for thousands of companies across the globe. I'm talking about ransomware. Ransomware is so effective because of how basic it is. It forces a company offline, and when a company goes offline and they can't make money, they are willing to pay millions of dollars to get back to normal. That's why ransomware has been able to flourish as much as it has, because it's gotten so much money into these attackers' hands at the peril of the victim organizations. But how does it go from no access to a total shutdown of a company's infrastructure? We're gonna talk about that today. So let's set the stage. We're gonna talk about a case study of an actual attack and talk through how does it happen from initial access all the way through encryption. So to set the stage, we have an organization, they're a professional services organization that typically rely on hourly work to make money. So this company has about 250 employees in total. When you look at the environment, they have about 20 servers, give or take. It's a heavily virtualized environment uh, and it's a Windows focused environment. They are running everything Windows. For their workstations and laptops, there's about 265 or so. You got one laptop for every employee with a few different uh, desktops that might be uh, in common areas. For backups, they're using a Veeam backup server uh, that is managing all of their local backups. Now, in terms of their security stack, they've had a limited investment in security. They're just using Microsoft Defender for, for antivirus. They're not using any of the latest and greatest uh, endpoint security technologies. This is important because it's leaving them a little bit more vulnerable uh, to ransomware than other companies that may have invested in broader security tech. So if you wanna visualize what this environment looks like, we've got a little bit of a representation here. You can see all the user workstations are there and we have our servers that are broken up based on their function. We have three domain controllers, we have three backup servers, we have four finance servers. These are gonna be servers that the finance team specifically is using uh, for everything that they need to do. Uh, and then you have a bunch of business specific application servers. These are gonna be unique to the environment, whatever they might need for running their day to day. This could also include file servers as well. And then lastly, we have IT servers that the IT team is gonna be using for managing the environment and testing things out. Now, in this situation, the initial compromise came from a phishing email. Now, a user in that environment received a phishing email that looked like it was coming from a known recipient. It was somebody that they had emailed with before. That email contained an Excel document as an attachment. Now, the user, seeing that it was coming from a known recipient, opens the document and clicks through for the macros and realizes, hey, it's not really part of my day-to-day, -day, so I'm just gonna ignore it. And they just move along. They don't realize that that phishing email contained the contents for a backdoor. Now, this isn't just any backdoor, this is Emotet malware. Now, the reason this is important is because Emotet has a unique feature that when it gets installed on a, a system, it will try to pull emails from that system. Now, the reason why the user in this scenario saw that it was coming from a legitimate source is because that user had been infected with e Emotet, and then the attackers just used the email to send another phishing email to our victim user here. Now, when the victim here opened up the email and launched that executable Excel document, they installed Emotet on their system. And so what happens here is that we have one infected system that then begins to beacon out to the Emotet server. Now, the attacker at this point has control over that system. When Emotet gets installed on the system, it's going to send data on the system to the attacker. And so it's gonna give it information on the infected system itself, as well as where in the world is this system. So it's gonna get some information on the organization itself. Now, this is important because 
we have an access broker that is going through and looking for high value targets. And when an access broker whose sole purpose is to resell access to compromised systems or accounts on the dark web to other attack groups, sometimes ransomware groups, they're gonna be in that position where they can say, hey, this is a high value target and I'm gonna price this accordingly. And so that access broker advertises access to our victim organization's uh, system on the dark web. They provide some high level information on the company on, on from which they were able to get from the open web. Uh, and they also detail out that, hey, through this infection, we were able to get privileges of a local administrator account. That's gonna fetch a higher price, whether instead of a, an account that just had normal user per, uh, permissions. So we have a ransomware affiliate who is just another group that operates with these certain ransomware groups to essentially get access to their toolkits, their encryptors and other things like the negotiation sites, all of that stuff. So this ransomware affiliate purchases access to this company for 2000 USD. What that is gonna do for them is it's gonna allow them access to that infected system. Now, once our ransomware affiliate gets access to that system, they then go and install Cobalt Strike, which is a post-exploitation framework, and they're installing that on that same system that was already infected with Emotet. Now, the reason this is important is because Cobalt Strike packages together a variety of different hacking tools for lateral movement, for uh, for escalating privileges, for dumping passwords. It's all the things that an attacker needs once they get access into the environment uh, to move around and accomplish their goal. So our ransomware affiliate installs that and they're ready to go for the next phase. Now, if we go back to our IT environment overview here, we can see that the Emotet malware is still beaconing out to the Emotet server but now the attacker has installed Cobalt Strike and that is now reaching out to a Cobalt Strike server, which the attackers can then use to interact with the system and really start facilitating the rest of this attack. Using Cobalt Strike as a conduit into the environment and interacting with that local system, the attacker is now able to try to escalate their privileges. Now, in this particular situation, the access broker already advertised that they had admin creds. So the attacker didn't really need to do much here, but it's just such a basic thing. You never know what you might get. So in this case, the attacker was able to obtain some additional password hashes that they can use later on in the attack if they so need it. But at this point, the attacker is also gonna start doing internal reconnaissance of the environment. So. They start out using a network scan of the environment to just kind of see what are the different systems that are out there uh, and really start getting a more accurate picture of what this environment looks like. Because right now, their lens is just of this single system, but they want to start seeing what are these other systems out there that I can potentially log into. At the same time, they're going to start querying Active Directory to get information on systems and accounts in the environment. Now, they're able to get information on the different systems that are there. They can start seeing information on domain admin accounts and things of that nature. Just as giving them a little bit more of a lens into, again, what does this environment look like? Now, from there, the attacker starts trying to log in other systems. Now, this is a situation where the company didn't follow best practices and they ended up using the same local admin password on all of the workstations. Now, the reason this is bad is because for those workstations, the attacker can just log into any of them using the local admin creds that they already collected. Now, when they're doing that, they're logging into other systems and they're dumping more creds from those systems. And so they're looking to see if there's any additional credentials that they can dump and get access to. Probably they're trying to look for a domain admin account where you know maybe a an admin who was uh, logged in as a domain admin came into one of the systems and left their credentials cached in in memory or somewhere else on that system. And so, as they're logging into a variety of different systems, they get lucky, they find a domain admin account, and then that enables them to start logging into other servers in the environment. 
Now, in addition to this, as they're logging into other systems, on a sample of them, they're gonna start dropping Cobalt Strike that's gonna beacon back out to the Cobalt Strike server. And the whole point of this is to ensure that they have backup systems that they can log into later on if one of the systems shut down or whatever it might be. So this is all about just broadening their ability to get back into the environment. So if we head back to our IT environment overview, we can see that the attacker is starting from that initial system that they had access to. And then they're going to use that local admin account to log into another workstation. Now, they can just log in using Windows RDP. Uh, it's a graphical representation of the system and it's as if they were sitting at that local system themselves at the keyboard. Now they log into the other one, they poke around, they dump some credentials, and then they're just gonna continue this chain. So from that second system, they log into a third system, dump credentials, keep kind of testing around, seeing what's there. They then log into a fourth system, same thing, uh, dropping credentials and just seeing what can I get from here. And then they log into the fifth one and this is where they're able to identify the domain admin credentials. And this becomes the game changer for them because once they have the domain admin credentials, they can log into any system they want here. And so because of that, the attackers log straight into a domain controller, which is what uh, houses all the authentication information in the environment and is really kind of the keys to the kingdom. It, once you get to those, you can go just about anywhere in a Windows environment. Now, they log into that domain controller, and then they log into a second one, drop that Cobalt Strike payload there, so that's beaconing out, and they're gonna continue poking around. They'll go from the domain controller into one of the business-specific application servers. From there, they're gonna go into another one. And again, this is all about just mapping the environment and getting familiar and just poking around to see what things are, are there. Now, at that point, they come back uh, into the environment, and they're going to uh, to go over to the workstation, and then they're gonna try out a finance server. The reason this is important is because the attackers can just log in to anything they want. And you can see they can chain all of these things together. It doesn't necessarily all have to originate from one initial compromised system. Because they're dropping Cobalt Strike on here, they can just interact with those systems directly. So they go to a finance server, they're checking out information there. They check out another business app server. Uh, they check out an IT server and see what tools are available there. Probably can get some additional good creds from that system as well, just because you figure all these other uh, admin accounts are probably logging in there. And then lastly, they're logging into the backup server. And this is what causes us concern because when they're logging into the backup server, they can do some pretty nasty things to start ensuring that you do not have backups available to you when you go to try to restore when the, the subsequent ransomware deployment comes. So once they get access to those backup servers, the attackers are celebrating because it really puts them in a good position that they're gonna increase the likelihood of getting a payday. By this point in the attack, the attacker has done a really good job of getting a solid sense of the entire environment. They kind of know where all the skeletons are and they really know more about the environment than probably anyone at that company does because they've spent the time intentionally learning about it and seeing how it's set up, how it's configured, uh, and just really getting to know it to facilitate the deployment of ransomware. Now, we know the attacker left off with these backup servers. And once they have access to those backup servers, the first thing that they do is delete those backups because at that point they know that's gonna increase their likelihood of getting a payment. Now, in order to get some additional leverage, they're also gonna steal data from the environment. And so they access one of the file servers and they begin archiving up some of the directories on there uh, and getting it staged for exfiltration. And so their choice here is to upload to a public uh, hosting site uh, that attackers like, it's called Mega. And so they just upload the data there. Now, they've got the, the backups deleted, they've got data that's been exfiltrated, and so now it's time to get ready to deploy the ransomware. And so the attacker will drop their deployment scripts on the domain controller, because we know from before, once they have access to the domain controller, that domain controller is gonna have access to just about every system in the environment. So they extract their toolkit, and then they press the go button. They deploy out their ransomware to the entire environment, and that encrypts almost all the systems in that environment. And this is what brings a company down to their knees when all of their IT systems 
are no longer functioning. If we look at this from our IT environment view, we can see the very first thing the attacker does, delete those backups. From there, they're archiving up the files on that file server, and they're gonna transfer that over to this mega cloud server. Uh, and so then the attacker has those files. They can download them and they can use that to extort the victim. From there, we see the toolkit getting deployed to that domain controller and all the attacker has to do at this point is deploy that ransomware and boom. Now we have all these systems that are encrypted. Now, you'll notice here that not every single system is encrypted. And the, the fact of the matter is, in most ransomware attacks, the majority of systems will be encrypted, but not every single one of them. And this is especially true for user workstations, because you can imagine maybe some of these user workstations were shut off for the night, or you know maybe they're powered down, whatever it might be, not every workstation is always going to get hit. And so typically we see a higher hit ratio on servers because those by nature have to be on uh, and operational. And user workstations, while they can get hit in larger numbers because there's more workstations than servers typically, it's not gonna be as complete uh, as it would be for the servers. Now, as these systems are getting encrypted, typically somebody's gonna find out about this. Uh, normally it starts where users are saying, hey, I can't access these files, or you know, IT might get some alarms going off that systems are acting a little bit funny. Uh, in this particular case, we had some users that started complaining that they're unable to log into the systems uh, and they're unable to open certain files that they had to, uh, they had been able to earlier that day. And so when the IT team decided to start triaging this, they were logging into some servers kind of poking around and they immediately noticed that there was a ransom note on the uh, infected server. Uh, and so these ransom notes are typically uh, broken English and will typically just say, hey, you've been hacked, you know, your files are encrypted, don't do anything except for contacting us. Uh, and typically it's gonna provide um, instructions on how to get in touch with the attacker, whether that is going to their ransomware site, whether that's an email that you have to send out, um, and in some cases, you'll get the ransomware demand up front. Uh, in most cases, though, you're going to have to start negotiating with the ransomware actor, uh, and you'll understand at that point what that's going to be. But this is what kicks off the discovery process. And really, this is the start of the incident response process. So at this point, typically what happens is the IT teams realize that, uh, hey, our backups are destroyed. We're kind of struggling here. We don't know what to do. And so at this point, typically you'll see companies ask for external help. Well, they'll go to an incident response company. They might be working with uh, an outside uh, IT vendor to support them, uh, or they might be filing something with their cyber insurance company uh, to try to get support there. But at the end of the day, you know, this is where it's really identified that the ransomware incident is occurring. You can see all of the things that happened before that, there's a lot. It isn't until the files are actually encrypted that the organization becomes aware that, hey, we've got a problem. And that's really how a ransomware attack happens. When you see all these big flashy news alerts for ransomware, this is the playbook that happens. It is fairly standard, brutally effective, and typically will result in an organization either having valid backups if they protected them, uh, or having to pay a ransom to try to get that decryption utility. If you've learned something new and you liked what you saw here, leave a comment, smash the like button, helps us understand what you're thinking about and whether or not this is useful for you. If you have any other ideas, let me know. We'd love to make some additional content to support you in your cybersecurity journey. And as always, subscribe to the channel. It helps grow the user base so that more people can learn about cybersecurity.